Hey friends, this is the last section dealing with Rome. As you can see, there's a lot to cover, so I will get right down into it. Why did the Roman Empire collapse? Historians really point to about four different events as being key to the empire's collapse. It's important to note that given that this is such a huge historical development, it's impossible to say that it was solely these four. But lots of texts and lots of scholars agree that four major factors had a role in the decline of the Roman Empire and its eventual collapse in 476 CE. And the first one involved weak, corrupt rulers such as Commodus, who we saw down here. Rome lost its status as a republic. And once it became an empire, we saw earlier with rulers like Caligula and Nero, who were likely insane, um, with Commodus, with other Roman emperors who just wanted solely everything for themselves and were greedy and didn't really have the people's best interest at heart, that they definitely had a major effect on the decline of the empire. There were several emperors who did a lot to help it and stave off the decline, but overall, um, the weak rulers really had a major role in that. Commodus is the one that I think most textbooks, Joaquin Phoenix uh, portrayed in the Gladiator, is the biggest one. Also, um, the nature of the Roman army had significantly changed. We didn't cover it in any of the videos for this course, but the status of being a Roman soldier was very much so one of prestige back in Roman times. Um, if you were a Roman soldier and you served, I think for 30 years, you retired with like a really nice pension and land and even a villa. Um, the pay was good and it was thought of as being um, a position of pride. But what happened later on in Roman Empire is they relied on mercenaries. Mercenaries are hired um, warriors to fight wars. And many of these mercenaries actually became emperors themselves because they had reliance to an emperor, not necessarily for an empire. We see that um, loyalty to one's country and land usually promotes better soldiers. These mercenaries didn't really have what it take, took. The size of the empire, as you can see in, in green and yellow here, it was huge. So just by nature, it's harder to control um, territories, especially um, in, the, in the Balkans and near the Danube River, where lots of um, raids were taking place. It was also hard to repel um raids from a newly invigorated persian empire too so just the size made it difficult and the last one involved serious economic problems notably inflation um, inflation is a time period um, or a economic phenomenon when money circulates but has less value so um, lots of times money would not be accepted in certain parts of the empire and um, some people uh, didn't have enough money to to pay for their goods and some money wasn't accepted um, and if we want to make a connection to our world right now, um, inflation is currently at a pretty high level right now. So hopefully they can address that. And again, on the timeline here too, um, historians can say now in hindsight that the death of Marcus Aurelius and the reign of Commodus, this is really what signaled the end. Um, a couple of notable emperors like Diocletian and Constantine are going to take um, matters into their own hands to try to save the empire. But by 476, um, Rome has officially collapsed. Really back, though, to Constantine, because our textbook also talks about his role. There was one battle in 312 that changed everything. The Battle of the Milvian Bridge on the Tiber River in Rome. I think I'm pronouncing this correct. I, I'll have to double check that. But the Tiber River on Rome. We talked about how Constantine had been baptized as a Christian. Um, what had happened was Diocletian had retired in 305, and he... Um, couldn't figure out who was going to succeed him. So there was five guys trying to become um, emperor. Constantine was one of them. And at the Battle of 312, he attributed his victory to a sign of a cross that he saw in the sky with the words, under this sign, you will conquer. One source tells us that, a cross um, with the allusion to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because remember, still by 312, um, Christianity is outlawed in the Roman Empire. Another account says he had a dream where his soldiers had crosses on their shields, whichever one is correct, Constantine decided to convert to Christianity and it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And it would spread to much of Europe. Um, so that happened. Constantine also took a couple other of actions. Here's a famous depiction of the Milvian Bridge. And here's the baptism of Constantine by Raphael. Again, we saw the School of Athens with Raphael. Um, this one is in the Vatican City. Also, Constantine is going to take a major action to help um, 
stave off the collapse of Rome. First, Diocletian had more or less decided to kind of split the empire into two, um, with the western half being run um, more or less uh, west of this line and the eastern half being run here. But Constantine also decided to take most of the activities of the capital from Rome and move it back here to the Straits of Bosporus. And there was a Greek city-state, formerly known as Byzantium, which became Constantinople, or the city of Constantine. Um, this is going to become the new most prosperous location in the entire Roman Empire. When Rome fell and the Western Europe collapsed, Constantinople was thriving for another thousand years under the Byzantine Empire, which was our next section to study. Um, we saw the attacks on multiple fronts, the Persians in the east with the Vandals and the Visigoths, and eventually, because of all of those reasons earlier, um, Rome was unable to stave off the attacks. The Romans called the Germanic tribes barbarians because they were different from the Romans. Uh, you saw the Visigoths here, the Huns, uh, the Lombards too, Vandals attacked even from uh, back in where Carthage was. They attacked Italy from all different fronts. In 410, the Visigoths under Alaric sacked Rome. Attila the Hun, ruler of the Huns, um, attacked Italy all around, um, around 450. He died in 453. And then the final Roman emperor, his name was Romulus Augustulus, and he was deposed. And this is the date that historians say the Roman Empire officially collapsed. Our text also notes a little bit, of, there's kind of irony in his name, Romulus. Um, I don't think I covered it in a video, but Romulus and Remus were the two brothers that allegedly founded Rome on the Tiber River. And Augustulus, similar to Augustus, who was one of Rome's strongest leaders then too. So he was the last one. His name provoked a little bit of irony. So the Roman Empire collapsed. Why it matters. I hope to go on a tiny quick rant and hopefully this makes sense. So going a completely different direction. We all love treasure hunts, right? Nicholas Cage. I think there's going to be another national treasure coming out. Okay, he needs to go away. But anyway, when the Roman Empire collapsed, we lost something. I'm going to see if I can kind of make this sense. This is like a, a really simplified version of it. And I'm sure there are parts of it where I'm, I'm going to kind of miss misspeak, but like all of Greek history, the frescoes, Cleisthenes, Solon, and Athenian democracy, the thoughts of Plato and Aristotle, the architecture evident in the Parthenon, the works of Pericles, Homer's The Iliad and the Odyssey, Greek drama, Demosthenes, The Lighthouse, Archimedes' Geometry, Elisa Strada and Sappho, their beautiful poetry, the sports, and Euclid, Aristosthenes, Archimedes, right? All of this Greek influence and Greek thought, which spread across much of the world, and also the Roman thought, um, the works of the Etruscans. Remember, the Romans are borrowing from the Greeks and the architecture from the bridges at Segovia, the Colosseum, um, the Roman Senate, the Roman judges, like all of um, Western thought, right? Like, whether good, whether bad, and that's subjective. That depends on on who is on viewing it. And, and like Julius Caesar and his conquests, Augustulus, all of this. Um, and this is where I'm, I'm just going to make like it, it was lost kind of like. And again, I'm sure you can come back to parts of it. And, you know, like I know, you know, there is probably bits and pieces of people remembered things from all of this, but it was lost. And I left this slide dark for a reason. Because the next chapter in history is called the Dark Ages um, of Rome. The Dark Ages, the Dark Ages, I mean, just the Dark Ages overall, or the Middle Ages, last from 476 to 1250. Historians call it that. Greek and Roman thought spread across much of the world. But then, like, it was lost when the empire collapsed for a long time. And we'll get into the Dark Ages, but I guess we can say it was a it was a, a worse time to be alive, I guess, maybe in 500, 600, 700. I'm speaking on behalf of tons of different people. But like, you know, we didn't have the art. We didn't have the trade. We didn't have the culture. It was like, quote unquote, lost in 476 when Rome fell. But I go back to that map because it's going to be rediscovered by many groups of people, but notably some of the Italians around 1250. And this year is going to spark what's called the Renaissance. And the Renaissance is this rebirth. It's like we had to find what here this X was all of that Greek and Roman culture that was just on the previous slide that we talked about. 
And there's tons more that we didn't cover just because you don't have time, but it was lost. And then even like we found it, we found the works of Plato and Aristotle. And there was this like rebirth, which is cool because Renaissance literally means a rebirth. And historians call it the revival of art and literature during the 14th and 16th century that helped to bring Europe out of the dark ages. And that's pretty cool. And that's why Nicolas Cage goes like that. I hope that made sense. I hope we enjoyed these two sections on Greece and Rome. I know I did. Thank you so much.